At one point, Mixpanel, we were churning almost half of our customers every year. And it was this place where as a company that's growing fast, you know, in some ways that can that metric can be overlooked. But in many ways, it was a time where we really came together and said, look, churning half the customers is a major, major problem in that we are clearly not driving and delivering the value as a company that we need to. And even though, you know, we're still growing, we have to go back and address churn. But the reality was much more complicated and nuanced. It so happened that there wasn't one answer, <laughs> you know, it wasn't one thing. It was a set of a bunch of different things that we needed to do. And so that's where our journey began. And we literally made a, you know, a series of categories of different priorities. We had a series of things that we were going to go out and, and tackle uh, and everyone in the company from go to market to EPD sort of had this core mission to go out and get this done. And the result was really incredible. And by the time we did our Series C, we were at 50 and this past spring, we almost touched 60, which is really like now kind of consumer grade category. And then retention went from, you know, 50 to close to 90%. Hello, my name is uh, Amir Movafagi. I'm the CEO here at Mixpanel. We are an event-based analytics company. Currently have 9,000 customers globally distributed. The company crossed the $100 million in revenue a little less than a couple of years ago. We're super proud to have our uh, one other metric that we disclose in our customer MPS being almost a consumer grade approaching 60. I was born in uh, in Tehran, in Iran. I spent seven years in Istanbul, Turkey. So I spent a good number of years there. We moved there when I was about eight. And then I came to the United States when I was 15. When I was uh, going through graduate school, it was a time when financial crisis had hit in New York. It was right at the, the beginning of where social platforms were coming online and uprising. Uh, in Iran, I couldn't get a hold of my parents because all the phone lines were were shut down, and you know email was not working. And at the time, Twitter was the only uh, uh, platform that was uh, really reporting what was happening on the ground in Tehran. And it was this sort of like incredible moment of realizing just how powerful the social platforms were becoming. At that point, it was such a personal attachment to the product that was my lead-in to tech. So I joined Twitter in 2010. When I joined the company, we were about a little over 100 employees. We were pre-ad revenue. It was an extraordinarily exciting time. Even Twitter, at its height of success, every six months was like a completely different company. You had this company that you would wake up, you all of a sudden had an ad product that failed. You kind of had a moment of having to really kind of have these moments of existential crisis, right? Hey, are we gonna have, you know, are we gonna have a company, you know, in six months? Is there gonna be, are we gonna be able to make it to the other side? In a lot of ways, the way that we go through and fix things together as a team is this ability to really come together on a core problem and we understand why we are focusing on what we're focusing. We have clarity around what objective and what outcome we're trying to get to and then we're flexible about the how, right? And we're able to take feedback along the way from our customers, from our peers, from our board, you know, from everybody, investors. Like we are able to learn and understand and then iterate and then hold ourselves accountable to these outcomes. So I think fixing problems at its core comes down to first really centering ourselves on why this matters, why it takes precedent priority over the 99 other problems you have, and then rallying and inspiring people to really get in and have clarity on how they can make an impact and difference on that journey. When I left Twitter, we had grown from nearly 100 employees to 4,500 employees. It was from close to zero to you know, 2 billion in revenue. It was um, phenomenal, incredible growth that happened during that time. Biggest lesson was the impact that user experience had on the success of the company and this obsession around delivering a better product, a better user experience, and sort of like a, in a way, having that as a leading path into better monetization and better growth. Companies in enterprise software have invested quite a bit on technology, you know, better utility, building a better technology as like a first 
order of business. Being part of Twitter, it was getting a lot more closer to just how much the significance of making sure that you're always thinking of the user or the customer first before you go figure out everything else. Because without the value, without that ultimate experience that you're delivering that's creating value, everything else can feel much more ephemeral and much weaker foundation. I think you know, in many ways, when you're part of a in, a in a great company that has a number of different opportunities to make an impact and connect and grow with, in many ways, you want to make sure that your skill set is you know rich enough and mature enough to be able to deliver a bunch of impact. But hopefully, if you're in the right position, you're also gaining a bunch of new knowledge and new tools. I think in many ways, the, the growth comes from just having that sheer intellectual curiosity and a desire to make sure that you're influencing and impacting things that matter. And so biggest one is this constant ability to ask, am I doing the thing that is the highest impact uh, work that I could be doing? Am I focusing on things that actually will drive and make a difference? And then usually if you're in the right role and you have the right foundational skill set, then the rest of it will take care of itself. You'll figure out resources and who to tap into. It's one of the best parts of being in Silicon Valley is you pick up the phone and you can call so many people around us that have either experienced that exact same situation that you're in. One of the things that I always mention, people talk about like, hey, what's so special about Silicon Valley? Why, you know, would I move my company there? Why would we, you know, start a company, you know, in Silicon Valley instead of somewhere else? The, and the answer I give is when I started at Twitter, we we're going through a bunch of new-ish problems that we were experiencing. And at that time, I remember just through networking, finding out experts that were, you know, at Facebook or at LinkedIn or at Google, and you would reach out and every single time, almost 100% of the time, they were willing to jump on a call and they were willing to collaborate and they were willing to give advice. And I think that was such a, a phenomenal sort of validation of just how important it is to be in an environment where people are experiencing that same set of growth ambition and experiences that they can impart and, and give to you as you're solving your, your problems in your company. Do you use Calendly to book calls, Todoist to manage tasks, Trello to keep track of projects? What if I told you that you could do all these with one tool, but then it also integrates with all of the tools that I just mentioned? Hi everyone, I'm Hannah from the EO team, and I'm here to introduce the game-changing productivity tool, Akiflow. It's basically a smart combination of all the essential productivity features I need on the daily. First is the beautiful marriage of task management and time blocking. Akiflow has this interface where you can create a to-do list just as you would in any task management tools, but you can also drag these certain tasks right into your calendar to the exact time of day. I find this particular visualization of to-dos and schedules side by side very helpful in prioritizing my work, carving out chunks of focus time needed for video editing. Blocking time here syncs with all of my other connected apps such as Slack, Calendly, and more. Secondly, it's the magical command bar, the go-to shortcut for all features within Akiflow. Instead of navigating the app manually, I simply click on the command bar to command what I wish to perform. For example, let's just say that we confirmed an interview filming and I want to put that in my calendar. I could just set that up manually on a Google Calendar, or I could simply go ahead and type Akiflow founder interview filming on October 28th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. and there's my schedule. We've been using it to keep track of our hectic filming and traveling schedules every day. Okay. At one point, McSpanel, we were churning almost half of our customers every year. And it was this place where as a company that's growing fast, you know, in some ways that can, that metric can be overlooked. You're like, hey, we're still, we're still growing. Things are still great. And, you know, you would show up and, and look at these numbers and you wouldn't even blink. You're like, yeah, we, we just had like half of our customers like walk out the door, but it's not a big deal because we're getting so much more and we're still growing. But in many ways, it was a time where we really came together and said, look, 
churning half the customers is a major, major problem in that we are clearly not driving and delivering the value as a company that we need to. And even though you know we're still growing, we have to go back and address churn as a way of making sure we have sustainable growth over time and that product needs to kind of get to this level of maturity over time. And you know, the problem was actually, this one was quite difficult because we were initially just trying to find like easy answers. You know, maybe this is a segment problem, like SMB has higher churn, maybe we just need to go to enterprise and that'll be the fix to all of our problems. But the reality was much more complicated and nuanced. And what it required was a very, very diligent way of again, segmenting and understanding the behavior from a different customers in different segments, and then being able to really narrow in on the reasons it, it so happened that there wasn't one answer, you know, it wasn't one thing. It was a set of a bunch of different things that we needed to do. And the list was quite overwhelming. The way that we came at it was instead of putting some crazy, insane kind of goal for where we wanted to be in a, in, a, in a year time, we acknowledged that retention was a lagging indicator, that it would take time for us to really move it. And so instead we said, what is the single kind of proxy leading indicator we can grab that would inspire the team, get them excited about making the right set of improvements um, in moving retention in the right direction. And then we shifted our focus to NPS, user NPS. We said, look, if we are able to improve user sentiment that's a much faster in product signal we're going to get from our users that starts going up then we know we can kind of move the dial on on retention over time and so that's where our journey began and we literally made a you know a series of categories of different priorities we had a series of things that we we're going to go out and and tackle uh, and everyone in the company from go to market to EPD sort of had this core mission to go out and get this done. And the result was really incredible. We were in single digits uh, MPS at the time, and we were able to move that 10 points every single year. And by the time we did our Series C, we were at 50. And this past spring, we almost touched 60, which is really like now kind of consumer grade category. And then retention went from, you know, 50 to close to 90% as a result, which I think, again, speaks to this ability to establish real feedback loops that allow you to understand whether you're, you're, the things you're doing are moving the needle and then having this kind of combination of leading lagging indicators so that you have things to inspire, get inspired along the way in your journey of execution rather than having to wait you know, a year to find out if something was working. Companies go through very, very different stages and challenges as they're going from no revenue to the initial uh, signals that there's demand and there's a need for their product to get 10 million milestone, they get to 50 million milestone, and there's huge drop-offs from each of these stages. Learning and experience that at least we've taken here at Mixpanel is the ability to really have a very rich, signal coming in from the pool of customers that you don't have right because so much of your signal and constant uh, feedback loop is around the core market that you're addressing and your core set of customers that are paying you today a lot of your signals are coming from existing customers and so along the way as companies maturing you want to make sure you always have in the initial phase you 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 just you want to get as small as possible solve the problem for the smallest audience that is uh, able to get value and pay you for for your product um, but as you're scaling and getting to 50 100 million plus then you're really trying to also make sure you have a lens toward the set of the part of the market that you don't own that you don't have and make sure that you understand what opportunities you have to grow and and continue to expand your offering and, and creating more value for a bigger part of the market. I think beyond product and, and signal from customers, the other dimension that's really critical as you're scaling is way that teams operate internally. How and the, the way that your executive team and you as a CEO need to operate is gonna change completely, right? As a 10 person startup, you're in a very different capacity. Everybody's uh, everybody's doing everything. And then your your need to then go create leverage, really create autonomy and ownership, modularity within the organization is going to be key uh, in driving kind of growth and success you need past a certain scale. I think product-led growth is, is really important. 
And I think sometimes we oversimplify what it means. Even Mixpanel, we've we've had quite a bit of a journey in terms of understanding the nuances of you know what it entails, what works within product-led growth, and what you need to augment and layer on. The, the fact of the matter is what's really awesome about product-led growth and what's so good about so many of the startups and different you know growth companies really leaning into to this. At its heart, the principle is that we have we need to have a really amazing product that's self-servable, that can people can get value out of right away that sort of speaks for itself uh you barely need to sell you know that's kind of like the the, the end all sort of uh, goal of product led and that's awesome but there is so much more to being able to leveraging product led growth and actually creating sustainable growth over time and a big part of that is this element of you know market education everyone is going to come in to your product with a very different set of maturity right they may be at a different part of the company different understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve as a company being very intellectually honest about truly segmenting and understanding where you have an opportunity to actually go drive product-led growth where you can deliver a self-serve for the most part a self-serve experience that's really key acknowledging that there's a space and there's absolutely an opportunity to be very sales-led in a way that you drive augmenting that product-led growth knowing that you can always rely and fall back on the fact that you have an incredible product that once you get to a right level of market education when you get to the right level of getting a customer to the same spot then your product will take care of the rest it's just this kind of core appreciation that initially product-led growth is really awesome because of its unit economics it's like the fastest the most affordable the best way you can possibly grow but it's kind of core at its core uh, it requires a really deep segmentation focus for it to work. Um, first one is about being open and being open to feedback. You know, we as people get attached emotionally to our decisions about how to go from point A to point B and just knowing that uh, having qualitative, quantitative feedback will let you course correct and make sure you get to the destination on time. Um, and then the second one is about being able to lead change and lead change has the element that mix panel every six months is going to be a fundamentally different company and we want not only individuals to you know be okay with change or support it but we want them to lead it we want them to know that we're going to need to explore and find ways to go out and create ways that we can create more value in the marketplace third is a uh, customer focus which at the end of the day we're only successful if our customers are getting value and so any decision we make around what product we prioritize how we do pricing and packaging right how we evolve our support organization is around this kind of long-term value that we're creating for our customers the fourth one is results oriented which acknowledges that you know the single best way for us to keep ourselves accountable on whether we're moving toward fulfilling our mission as a company to help the world learn from its data is uh, people's willingness to pay us money to, to solve that problem and so top line ARR growth are we uh, driving that in a sustainable fashion through the right margin profile File. And then finally is the one team which really emphasizes the importance of establishing meaningful connections among employees to move beyond the transactional Zoom interactions into a place where they know each other, they can trust one another. So when they do get into a position of conflict, there's a foundational trust and safety that allows them to work through those things productively.